Good evening, everyone. My name is Seamus McCaffrey, the Chair of Ag Research. Um, I take the opportunity of welcoming everyone uh, to this webinar, uh, which is delivered in partnership with AFPE and CAFRI on the subject of fertilizer planning. Uh, this is one of two webinars uh, this evening dealing with dairy, and uh, next week we'll be dealing with uh, the beef and uh, sectors. The uh, topic of fertilizer planning is particularly appropriate, and the, hopefully the timing is good for us, uh, having regard to the dramatic increases in fertilizer prices. Uh, AFBE uh, commissioned uh, this piece of work to be done and, uh, com and uh, commissioned AFBE, and we are very pleased to have with us this evening from AFBE, uh, Debbie and David, and from Caffrey, Avine and Robert. Um, the chair for the evening is Sinclair, who many of you will know, and at this point, I will hand over and invite Sinclair uh, to chair the remainder of the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Seamus. And uh, it's a pleasure to chair this very important webinar this evening and great to see so many people uh, signing in online. And uh, hopefully there will be uh, some useful information in terms of this whole challenge of dealing with the uh, unprecedented increases in fertilizer price this year. Just before we start, we'll maybe start with some of the housekeeping rules. Uh, first of all, everyone's automatically muted as you join. So don't worry about any background noise that won't be picked up uh, during the webinar. We would really encourage you to use the question and answer function, uh, which is at the bottom of your screen. If you scroll along the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A uh, button there. If you press that, uh, then you can type in your question and you can type in your question at any stage during the, uh, the webinar, during the talks or uh, and ideally uh, so that we can deal with those then when it comes to the Q&A session at the end. If you have issues uh, in terms of internet links and so on, usually what we find is if you leave, the, just press the red button on the bottom right and then rejoin and that usually fixes them pretty well. The webinar will be recorded uh, so that it'll be available uh, on the Ag Research Cafe and AFB websites uh, after this evening. And we would encourage you all to stay to the end. Uh, I promise we'll try our best to finish at half nine this evening. And we would like you to complete a feedback survey at the end, just to outline whether the, the webinar has been helpful and also to, to maybe put in ideas, suggestions uh, for future webinars or uh, events of this nature. So that completed, we're, we're ready to go. As Seamus has already mentioned, we've seen an unprecedented increase in fertilizer prices over the last number of months. And unfortunately, this will have major implications for production costs uh, this year. However, grass remains our cheapest feed, and it's important that we look carefully at the implications of reducing fertilizer use particularly if this ends up in uh, resulting in a feed shortage next winter, which would be the worst case scenario that we could end up in. So we need to look very carefully at levels of fertilizer use. We also need to uh, maximize our efficiency of, of using the fertilizer that is applied and to look at other alternatives, uh, particularly how to make best use of manure and slurry. Uh, and that's becoming an increasingly val valuable commodity across all farms. So next slide, please, Gillian. We have four excellent speakers lined up to discuss these topics this evening. Uh, so we start with the science and Dr. Debbie McConnell from AFBE will present results of a recent review which was commissioned by Ag Research back in the autumn when we became aware of uh, the increases in fertilizer price. And, and uh, Debbie will look at the cost benefits of fertilizer application. For paper two, then we move to uh, CAFRI and Evine McMullen will discuss the benefits of soil nutrient management for grass growth. And we stay with CAFRI for paper three and Dr. Robert Patterson will present a paper on practical on-farm strategies for fertilizer use on farms. 
And then finally, we move back to AFPE and uh, conclude this evening with a paper from Dr. David Patterson, who will examine longer term options for reducing reliance on chemical fertilizer. So if all goes to plan and our speakers uh, have promised to stick to time, we will start our Q&A session around nine o'clock. So please do type in your questions uh, and we will pick those up then at nine and aiming to finish around 9.30. So we'll move to our, our first talk, and that's the presentation from Dr. Debbie McConnell. Uh, Debbie is a dairy research scientist at AFBE, specializing in dairy grassland research, and she will discuss the results of her recent Ag Research Commission review on the cost benefits of fertilizer use. So thank you, and over to you, Debbie. Thank you very much, Sinclair, and good evening, everybody listening at home. Um, as Sinclair mentioned, really what I want to do over the next 15 or 20 minutes or so was just take a little bit of a look at um, the cost benefit of fertilizer application, um, given the real increases in fertilizer price that we've seen in the last um, uh, couple of months. Um, next slide, please, Gillian. Okay, so I suppose by way of background, um, nitrogen is obviously a key nutrient um, to us here in Northern Ireland in our grassland production systems. Our dairy systems and our dairy cows roughly eat in around the region of about 58 million tonnes of forage every year, be that either as grazed or inside grass. So it is a huge feedstuff that we have available to us. And obviously nitrogen, uh, we are going to be reliant on nitrogen fertiliser to contribute to producing um, those high volumes of that forage. Northern Ireland at the minute roughly imports of about 342,000 tonnes of fertiliser per annum, and that's been declining over the last few decades. Um, but a considerable proportion of that is still nitrogen, so about 86,000 tonnes of nitrogen coming into Northern Ireland each year. Um, and so because of that, we're obviously quite exposed to um, outside fertiliser prices. Now, as we're all very much aware, in the last sort of 12 months, we have seen massive increases in energy prices. The graph on the right hand side here, there just shows UK natural gas prices from uh, this time last year up to January 2022. And you can see that in the autumn time, natural gas prices have really significantly rose. There has been a bit of easing back in January 2022, but how long that will stay, we don't know. Um, but certainly um, there's been that those rapid increases in energy prices. And because energy is such an important component of the fertilizer manufacture proce process that has really impacted on the cost of, of producing fertilizer, particularly in Europe, where those energy prices increases have been felt the most. So what we've had, what we've seen happen is a number of uh, fertilizer production factories um, either cease production or reduce production quite significantly um, during the autumn period because of that. On top of that, we've had uh, COVID disruptions to both the, the fertilizer manufacture um, process and to the transport infrastructure, which involves getting our fertilizers um, from the factory to the farm. So that's impacting as well. And around the world as well, we've seen a go global reduction in fertilizer exports. Um, so for example, China has reduced the amount of fertilizer they're producing due to the cost of coal. And we've seen Russia reduce their fertilizer exports as well. So it's all coming together in a bit of a perfect storm to really um, uh, cause significant increases in fertilizer prices. And uh, next slide, please, Gillian. Um, and that's really what we've seen um, through autumn 2021 uh, through to spring 2022. The graph on the right hand side shows global fertilizer prices from 2008 to, to 2021. Um, and you can see that really we and the last data from that uh, was entered in October of this year. And so we've seen further price increases since then. But you can see by that stage we'd reached October, we're probably sitting at a 10 year high globally in terms of fertilizer prices. Um, and uh, so really um, that, 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 that certainly has been an unprecedented lift. Now there is a high degree of uncertainty for prices for 2022. Um, and we don't know what will happen uh, there and whether there's opportunity for those to come down. What we do know is prices at the minute are still holding quite high. And, and because of that, then we've got some key questions. So how does that increase in fertilizer price impact my overall cost of producing forage? Because it is such an important component of the forage production system. Is it still cost effective then to spread that fertilizer, given that it has gone up so much in price? And if we are going to spread any fertilizer, how do we maximize the value of that? So really tackling the first one of those questions, uh, Gillian, if we move to the next slide, please. What impact does fertilizer price increases have on the cost of producing forage? 
So we look, if we look at either graze grass or grass silage, fertilizer costs typically account for about 25% um, of graze grass, the full economic cost of producing a kilo of graze grass, 12% or 18% of the full economic cost of two cut or three cut silage systems respectively. It's slightly higher, fertilizer accounts for a higher proportion of the cost in grazing systems um, because more than nutrients in that system is supplied by artificial fertilizer compared to slurry, which has more of a role in silage systems. And what we can see, and, and these are full economic costs, so there is a land cost included here, is that if we've got fertilizer um, costing about £300 a tonne, um, on the graph on the right hand side, we can see it costs us about £84 a tonne to produce a tonne of grazed grass, and 146 and 169 for two cut and three cut silage systems, um, respectively. That equates to roughly about uh, 42 pounds a tonne in terms of cash cost for grazed grass and somewhere between 70 and 94 pounds a tonne um, for silage in terms of cash cost. What happens, however, when we increase canned fertilizer prices for 300 to 600 pound a tonne, roughly equates to somewhere in the region of 11 to 22 pound increase in forage chuck production cost per tonne of dry matter. And when we multiply that up to the impact that will have over a typical grazing platform, say you take a 40 hectare grazing platform, that equates to an increased energy or increased expenditure um, of about 8,940 pounds per year. And under a silage system, again, on a 40 hectare silage uh, plat platform, the increase in that cost from 300 to 600 pound a ton for canned fertilizer means we've got an extra spend of about 5,000 pounds under a two cut silage system and just shy of 8,000 pounds per year on a three cut silage system. So as we can see, the overall price of fertilizer is having quite a significant impact there on what we are going to spend um, and, and the, over the course of a year in terms of producing forage. So it's really important then that we um, understand whether or not that fertilizer is good value for money um, and we will get that return in terms of the grass value that's being produced. And I suppose one way to do that and how we start assessing that is to look at the nitrogen, uh, the, the grass growth response that we get to the nitrogen that we apply. So Gillian, if you move to the next slide. So really um, what we have been looking at here is sort of nitrogen response curves. And basically what we're looking at is um, the grass response that we get for every kilogram, every extra kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer that we apply. And the graph on the right hand side is a very typical grass growth response curve for us here in Northern Ireland. So on the bottom axis, we've got our nitrogen application rate and on the um, uh, vertical axis, we've got grass dry matter yield. And as we expect, as we increase our nitrogen application rate, our grass dry matter yield increases as we go up. But it's not a straight line. There is a curve in that line and it does flatten out. So if we look at a couple of different points on that line, the first star on the left hand side there is 150 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare application rate. At that stage, when we apply every extra kilo of nitrogen that we're applying there, we're getting about 26 kilograms of grass dry matter back. When we move upwards to 300 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, that response rate starts to fall quite significantly. At that stage, we're only getting 15 kilograms of grass for every one kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer that we apply. And then when we get up into very high rates of nitrogen fertilizer application, 450 kilos of nitrogen per hectare, we're only getting five kilograms of grass for every additional kilogram of nitrogen that we're applying at, the, applying at that stage. So what we're really seeing is that obviously as fertilizer application rate increases, nitrogen response rate decreases and once we get above 300 uh, 300 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare we are sig seeing significant reductions in that nitrogen response rate and that's really because at those higher nitrogen application rates other factors such as soil temperature um, the light levels soil moisture they become a lot more limiting um, whereas at, at the lower nitrogen application levels nitrogen tends to be uh, principally one of the most limiting factors that's there. Um, and I suppose, but what we see is that that grass growth response um, to fertilizer is incredibly variable and it's influenced by a range of factors which vary significantly between farms, um, uh, within, within fields and uh, across the seasons as well. In fact, weather can have a very big bearing on it. Um, but what we did take, take a look at was the grass yield data from the GrassCheck program uh, over the last 10 years. And typically what we found that 
in Northern Ireland is that our average response rate to every kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer we're applying, we get about 20 kilograms of grass dry matter back. And so our question really is going forward, if we are applying one kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer and it's costing us more to do that, is that 20 kilograms of grass feed value worth it? Are we getting more value there in terms of the grass feed um, than we are and what it costs to sow that, that, that kilo of nitrogen fertilizer? So if we move on to the next slide, please, Gillian. So really, when we're evaluating the cost benefit of fertilizer application, that's what we're weighing up. We're comparing the relative feed value of grass produced versus the cost of the fertilizer. When we're talking about the relative feed value of the grass, how we're doing that is we're saying if we had to, if that grass, that ton of grass supplied a certain amount of energy, what would it cost us then if we were to buy that in in terms of concentrate feedstuffs? So what we're doing in these calculations is we're assuming a concentrate price of £300 a ton. A grass quality of 11.3 ME, which is taken from our grass check farm average and a grass utilization rate of 80%. And we put this in a ratio. So the, the feed value of grass compared to the cost of fertilizer. And if we got values greater than one, then the grass feed value is greater than the fertilizer cost. And so in that scenario, um, certainly it's more economical to be applying fertilizer. If we're getting values less than one, our grass feed value produced is less than the fertilizer cost. Um, and so in that scenario, it's not economical really to be applying fertilizer. Next slide, please, Gillian. So what did the results show us? Well, if we look at the graph here, we can see, um, uh, see some quite significant trends. So on the bottom line of the graph, we've got canned fertilizer price uh, rising from 300 to over a thousand pounds um, per ton. And on the left-hand axis, on the, uh, on the vertical axis, we've got our grass value to feed uh, cost ratio. Now, if the lines fall within the gray area, that means our grass feed value is greater than our fertilizer cost. If they cross into the blue area at the bottom of the grass, our grass feed value is less than our fertilizer cost. So in that scenario, it's not economical to be applying fertilizer. So what we can see, first of all, is that as our canned fertilizer cost rises, all of our lines on, on the graph do fall as that fertilizer cost rises. So if we take can at 300 pounds a ton, the grass value that we get is typically in the region of about five, um, our ratio values are about five, 4.49 to 5.68, depending on which line that you're looking at there. So what that means is at 300 pound a ton, the feed value that we're getting out of that kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer that we're applying is five times greater than the cost of the fertilizer. Unfortunately, as Callan moves to 600 pounds a ton, that ratio decreases to somewhere in the region of about 2.5. So in that scenario, at 600 pounds a ton, the feed value is still greater than what it costs for the fertilizer, um, but it's only about two and a half times greater than the cost of the fertilizer. So our margins there are starting to reduce um, a little bit. And so the other thing that we can see from the graph is that as application rate increases, the grass value to fertilizer cost ratio decreases. So the orange line here is an application rate of 150 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. The purple is 200 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare and the blue line is 250 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. So what we can see is that those slightly higher um, fertilizer um, uh, cost values or at those higher, sorry, fertilizer application rates, we're getting a slightly lower um, grass value fertilizer cost ratio. Um, but importantly in this scenario, and all curves are still remaining above that sort of critical value of one. So we are getting slightly higher feed value back than we are um, at the, than the cost of the fertilizer. If we move on to the next slide then please, Gillian. And if we look at urea, it's a very similar story. So if we look at urea at 400 pounds a ton, we get somewhere in the region of about six and a half times the value in terms of, uh, of the grass value back compared to what it's costing us to spread the fertilizer. Um, but when that urea um, value or that urea cost rises to 800 pound a ton, again, that halves and reduces to about um, 2.9 to sort of 3.6, depending on which line you look at um, in terms of the, the, fer the feed value to fertilizer cost ratio. But again, in all scenarios here, we see as application rate increases, grass value to fertilizer cost ratio decreases, but then as well, all curves still remaining above that ratio of one. So in all scenarios here, we still are seeing a better return um, from the fertilizer um, in terms of the feed value of grass produced. 
Now that was modelled um, with data um, under fairly good conditions. So we've got um, uh, good soil pHs, we've got good soil, we've got uh, good growing conditions, um, and that was the data that was um, used, or that was the scenario that was used in that, in that model. But when we um, start to think about um, looking at nitrogen response, and I, and I mentioned it earlier, nitrogen responses to, or grass response to nitrogen fertilizer is quite highly variable and uh, can be influenced by a whole range of factors. And Gillian, if we move on to the next slide, please. What we see is that it can be influenced by a range uh, um, of different things. Um, and these can have quite a significant bearing then on actually that value that we're getting back from that fertilizer. So for example, soil health can impact uh, quite significantly on how grass responds to fertilizer application. Swar sward composition as well, if we have a high content of docks in our field or more native grasses, um, uh, creeping bent, um, uh, so, uh, you know, in, in this ward, the more native grasses, Yorkshire fog, the more native grasses that we have there aren't designed to respond to nitrogen in any way near the same as the perennial grey grasses that we use today have been bred to do so. So we're not going to get anywhere near the same nitrogen response there. Time of year can have an impact in application um, conditions as well um, at the time of application. Um, you know, it, roughly in around the springtime, for every one degree increase in temperature that we see, we tend to get back somewhere in the region of five to six percent more nitrogen is recovered in the grass so certainly time of year and weather conditions can have a have a big impact as well and just to look at that in a little bit more detail um Gillian, if we move on to the next slide soil health um as i mentioned has a big um uh, impact on how nitrogen fertilizer um or how grass response to nitrogen fertilizer for example poor soil structure um uh can impact on it. Some data from SRUC um, in uh, Scotland has shown that when soils are compacted, less of the nitrogen fertilizer that's applied is taken up in the grass and more of it is released to the atmosphere as nitrous oxide emissions. If we have soils with inhibited biological activity, we can, we can again see that nitrogen uptake by the plant is inhibited. And soil pH status is a really big one. This is some data on the left-hand table from Michael Egan down in Chuggis. And he's shown that a different uh, soil pH uh, we get different levels of fertilizer um, use. Um, so at soil pH levels of five to five and a half, our nitrogen utilization is only 77%. So we're not getting full utilization of the nitrogen fertilizer that we apply. And in fact, we can waste up to as much as 32% of our fertilizer. So, and that has an impact then on those cost benefit ratios that we were talking about earlier on. This time, when we look at the table here, we can see across the board, if we've got a soil pH of 5 to 5.5 and we're getting less or poor grass or poor nitrogen utilization, we see that at those higher um, costs of, of CAN, um, we are getting uh, sort of uh, ratios which are getting closer to that critical value of one. So we can see at those high, cons uh, high fertilizer prices and higher application rates, 1, 1.2, 1.4. So in that scenario, we are creeping closer um, to that fertilizer not being economical to apply. Next slide, please. And I mentioned as well that the impact of time of year on the cost benefit of fertilizer application. And, and certainly we've had a look at our grass check data to see typically what sort of nitrogen responses we get at different times of the year. And the table on the left hand side, sort of the, the second column over shows for each month of the year, the typical nitrogen response rate that we're getting or grass growth response rate, rate that we're getting. So how many kilograms of grass dry matter are we getting per every kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer that we apply? And you can see in March on average over the last 10 years, it's been quite low at four. And that has a real impact on ter in terms of our um, our ratio in terms of feed value to fertilizer price ratio. We can see that actually if when we're getting responses of only four kilograms of grass dry matter, um, in those scenarios, we're really failing to get above that critical um, ratio value of one. Um, so we're not getting the cost benefit back. But the one thing I think we uh, we would all sort of acknowledge is that we're getting much more volatility in the seasons now, um, uh, both within them and between seasons as well. And if you move on to the next slide, Gillian. Yeah. <sighs> 
if we look in more detail at the, the grass growth rates that we've had in March over the last sort of 10 years or so, we can see growth rate conditions anywhere for two and a half kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day, up to 34 and a half kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day. In March time, really what we're seeing is soil temperatures being quite limiting and day length um, limiting in terms of light levels. Um, but that data, when we look at the variability in the data, we see there are instances, there are sometimes in March where we can get really good grass growth. And in that scenario, then um, nitrogen fertilizer application is much, looks much more appealing um, because we're, we're much further away from those um, uh, low, uh, below one um, ratios. But similarly, then in the months where we expect to get really good grass growth, what we've seen in recent years is that impact of drought conditions. And if we roll back to sort of June and July 2018, in that stage, we recorded grass growth rates of 17 and a half kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day, well below what we would expect at that time of year on our plots. And farms recorded even lower than that. And that's really been inhibited by soil moisture. So again, we can't take anything for granted anymore in terms of the time of the year. Although March tends to be a risk year and wants to apply fertilizer equally there will be times throughout the year because of the weather conditions that again we need to question that fertilizer price and cost and and feed value cost ratio and so the one thing i would say then to do is take a look at the sort of the latest weather data which is on the grass check website and also the grass the grass check grass growth forecast do build in the grass the weather forecast for the next two weeks and give a prediction of grass growth and that will give an indication as to the likely potential response to nitrogen fertilizer. So if we just move on to the next slide, I just wanted to finish up there, but really I suppose for myself, um, sort of what we've been finding is obviously recent fertilizer price increases have had a massive impact on the cost of producing both grazed grass and grass silage. However, when we look at the economics of it, good quality grass us remain the cheapest feed stuff that we have available to us here in Northern Ireland and in many of the scenarios that we've modeled actually the ratio of grass value to fertilizer cost is still positive and that's primarily given the high cost of alternative feeds you know if we're buying in concentrate to replace that energy obviously um, then that's that that's leaving our grass in a very good light however that said, the increase in fertilizer price is significant and it's going to add an awful lot to the cost of producing grazed grass and grass silage. So if we do want to get maximum bang for our buck in terms of any fertilizer that we apply, it's really important that we make sure that we try and maximize that nitrogen response. And to do that, we need good soil health. We need to get our timing of fertilizer application right so we're not coinciding with times of poor weather and we need to optimize our grass utilization as well. That's all from me. Thank you very much. I'll pass back to Sinclair. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Debbie. A lot of good information there. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions, but we'll, we'll uh, aim to come back to those at nine o'clock and pick them up later. Uh, we'll move on to our next presentation, which is from Avin McMullen. Uh, Avin is a senior agricultural technologist at CAFRE, providing guidance and advice on nutrient management planning. And Avin's paper will focus on the importance of nutrient management planning for best use of fertilizers and animal manures. Over to you, Evening. Thank you. Thank you, so Sinclair. Um, just checking, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, all good. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Jason. Yeah. OK, thank you, Sinclair. And good evening, everyone. Uh, from a nutrient management point of view, I'm going to take you back to basics and look at areas of the importance of carrying out an assessment of soil nutrient and soil health status. Look at the value of nutrients on farm, uh, the advantages of using a fertilization plan. Uh, how to apply nutrients to optimize their potential and achieve maximum effect and the key rules and regulations to be mindful of. So next slide, please. Soil analysis has never been more important and is a starting point for working out crop nutrient requirements. Knowledge of basic soil fertility will allow you to correct your pH and maximize the use of slurry and target manures at low phosphorus and uh, potassium index soils where they're most needed. A soil analysis service is provided through the DERA direct offices 
simply phone or email to order sampling kits and borrow soil overs. Uh, sample every four years, uh, taking random cores across the field or group of fields up to four hectares in area. Next slide, please. Um, building on what uh, Debbie has said, this slide again shows the effect of pH on fertilizer efficiency. As pH increases from five to the range of six to six and a half, a greater percentage of the nitrogen, phosphorus and potash applied will be utilized by the plant and less fertilizer will be wasted. On the right hand column, you can see the potential financial loss resulting from low pH, which is a, a significant figure at today's fertilizer prices. Next slide, please, Gillian. Soil structure is also very important. You really don't want anything to impede growth this year. So get the spade out, look for compaction, any panning, and any areas of poor grass growth. Soil structure directly affects the movement of air and water through the soil profile, um, which in turn affects biological activity, crop establishment and root development, and also tolerance to environmental stresses, such as drought mentioned by, by Debbie earlier. Doing a simple worm count can be an indicator of the soil health and the biological activity uh, going on in, in the field. By doing a sward assessment, potential yield losses can be identified. For example, problems with field drainage or weeds such as weed grasses or docks. These you know, weed plants are feeding off the nutrients in the soil and will ultimately reduce grass yield. Short-term action should be taken to rectify these problems such as unblocking drains and controlling weeds. Next slide, please, Gillian. Organic manures such as slurry, farmyard manure, poultry litter and anaerobic digestate are valuable commodities this year and should be assessed in, the in terms of the nutrients that they will supply. Using standard figures and looking at a typical 6% dry matter slurry, we can see that one kilogram of nitrogen, 0.6 of phosphate and 2.3 kilograms of potash are supplied in every cubic meter of slurry. This equates to nine units of nitrogen, five of P and 20 units of K in every thousand gallons applied. This is assuming spring application using low emission spreading equipment at the nitrogen availability of 40%, uh, phosphate at 50% available, availability where you have a P index of two or greater and 90% potash availability. Next slide, please, Gillian. Now, last year, I was telling farmers that they needed a fertilization plan to fulfill the requirements of the Nutrients Action Programme and comply with the regulations. This year, the emphasis has changed. Do you need a fertilization plan to show when, where, and how much manure and fertilizer to spread? The CAFRI Crop Nutrient Calculator satisfies the NAP requirements and provides farmer farmers with a simple and easy to use fertilization planning tool. The calculator is available on their online services and can be accessed via the government gateway account. Next slide, please, Gillian. Within the calculator, step one is entering your field details and soil analysis results. And then step two, select the crop, for example, grazing or silage or any arable crop. The manure and fertilizer function, which is highlighted, provides an instant crop recommendation and allows you to input various combinations of organic manure and or chemical fertilizer to be applied during the season. Next slide, please, Gillian. The calculator will provide the maximum crop recommendation for your choos chosen crop. In this case, it's first cut silage in a three cut system on a two plus P index and two minus K index soil. Please note that this is the maximum recommendation to achieve the highest yield for a silage system. So in this example, it's aiming to achieve high digestibility uh, silage at 12 to 15 tons of dry matter uh, throughout the year. If you're expecting a lower yield or lower quality silage, then you should apply less nutrients. 
Uh, it's important to match nutrients supplied to the crop yield expected as excess nutrients will either be held in the soil or more likely lost to the environment. And, and this is a waste and a cost to the business. Next slide, please, Gillian. This section allows you to add organic manures. You can select the, the type of manure, the volume to be applied, the method of application and timing. Um, and all these factors will affect nutrient, or nutrient availability, in particular nitrogen. And using this uh, section here will help you to, to maximize the potential of your slurry by uh, adjusting uh, rates and, and methods of application. Next slide, please, Gillian. Similarly, to top up with chemical fertilizer, select the type of fertilizer from the drop down menu and enter the quantity to be applied in kilograms per hectare. If there's a particular uh, manure that's not listed or fertilizer, there's also a section there where you can put in uh, the analysis details of the manure or the spec of the chemical fertilizer. Um, uh, as, as shown in the boxes. Next slide, please, Gillian. Here we can see the total nutrients to be applied for first cut, uh, both from slurry and from straight nitrogen fertilizer. The bottom line shows the balance of nutrients to, to be supplied. And had we supplied uh, oversupplied any one of the three nutrients, the system would state oversupplied and highlight the figure in red as a warning. And that's quite useful to keep, uh, to keep everybody right to the right side of the regulations. Next slide, please, Gillian. When all field areas and crops have been entered, a summary report can be downloaded. This provides a useful table showing the amount of slurry to be applied across the whole farm and the quantity of each chemical fertilizer required for the season. This will be a very useful tool to plan and budget fertilizer purchases this season. So I would encourage you uh, following this meeting or, or some evening soon, sit down, get, get onto the calculator and, and use it to, to plan out your fertilizer purchases. In this example, slurry has been maximized Chemical nitrogen fertilizer has been used to top up the nitrogen requirement and straight potash has been applied to maintain potash levels. Fairly simple system. And Robert will go into more detail uh, when he comes to uh, farm scenarios later uh, in the presentation. Next slide, please, Gillian. When it comes to application, again, just reiterating what Debbie has said, be guided by the weather. Uh, apply when soil temperature reaches at least five and a half degrees and grass growth has commenced. And the AFBI grass check is a useful asset for monitoring grass growth and should be referred to. Applying slurry in spring will result in better utilization in comparison to late summer applications. So aim to hit grass at the start of the season as grass growth starts and have the nutrients in place for peak grass growth as the season progresses. Also, don't apply when rain is forecast for the next few days. There's little point in applying nutrients where there is a risk that they could be washed into waterways where pollution could be caused and valuable nutrients are lost from the fields where they are needed. Using low emission slurry spreading equipment will reduce ammonia emissions and increase nitrogen efficiency. Research shows increases in efficiency when using a dribble bar and further increases if using a trailing shoe. Low emission also allows application to heavier grass covers, particularly with the trailing shoe, where grass is parted and slurry is placed close to the ground and there's less risk of sward contamination. Regular maintenance of the working parts of slurry and fertilizer spreading equipment is important to ensure correct application. Very often calibration of spreading equipment is overlooked and Chagas have developed a very simple phone-based slurry calibration tool based on the time required to empty a tanker, the tanker size and bout width to determine the required forward speed for a chosen application rate. This is a, a useful little tool. Next slide, please, Gillian. 
Accuracy of application can be improved with the use of technologies such as border limiters, GPS guidance, and variable rate application. Technology which some farmers and many contractors are now making use of. Next slide, please, Gillian. Just to remind you of the relevant NAP regulations, take care to observe buffer zones and no spread areas around fields. Stay two meters from all water courses when spreading chemical fertilizer and 10 meters for organic manures or three meters if using low emission equipment. But remember, distances for slurry spreading increase during the month of February to 15 meters and five meters if using lessee. And maximum application rates are reduced to 30 cubic meters per hectare or 2,700 gallons per acre. A fertilization plan is required if applying chemical pea fertilizer to grassland. High pea manures, such as pig farmyard manure, poultry litter from laying hens or broiler breeders, or anaerobic digestate to any land. A fertilization plan must show that there's a crop requirement for the identified pea index from a recent soil analysis. Next slide, please, Gillian. So in summary, the take home messages are, if you haven't already done so, get out and take some soil samples. Use this information to create a fertilization plan and target manure, your manures where they're needed most and apply chemical fertilizer to top up the nutrients where required. And thank you. Back to Sinclair. Okay, thanks again, Evelyn. And uh, we'll now move on to the practicalities of fertilizer use on dairy farms. And we've got Robert Patterson, who is the dairy technologist at CAFRI, will take us through the options at farm level. So Robert, over to you, thank you. Thanks, Sinclair, for your introduction and thanks to the previous two speakers. Um, I suppose um, we'll move on to the next slide there, Gillian, please. I suppose this presentation probably seeks to, to focus more on some on-farm scenarios and see, well, based on the scenario that, okay, we have, we have the, the bags of fertilizer sitting in the yard and we have slurry in the tank, um, where, where are we going to go where, or how are we best going to utilize this um, these nutrients going forward this season. So just to reiterate what has already been stated, obviously the cost of, of the bags of fertilizer coming into the yard are not the only thing that are gonna influence the, the efficiency of the fertilizer. Um, it's, it's as much made up on, on how much grass we can grow as a result of it. And more importantly, how much of that grass can we turn into a, a saleable product in, in meat or, or, or milk, sorry. So just, just a few things to recap on before we move on. Uh, as, as has been mentioned previously, the soil needs to be warm enough, uh, preferably five and a half degrees at 10 centimeters depth. Um, as Avian says, we need, we need field specific plans. Um, it's no point throwing those soil analysis into the bottom drawer. We, we need to, to analyze them and we need to get plans put in place uh, to maximize the, the use of our slurry in coordination with our, our nutrients action plan. Uh, rotation of sowing, sowing less and sowing more often will help to increase the utilization and the efficiency of that fertilizer. And ideally, um, as soon as uh, grazing uh, has, has taken place, to increase the, the length of time between grazing um, and, and, and the next grazing. As well as our, our field specific plans, um, a very valuable thing to be doing this year is to record our fertilizer use uh, on a field basis, um, how, much, how much it got, when it got it. Um, and indeed, if, if you haven't been measuring grass uh, before this, this could be a very key year to start doing so. Um, if, if we're able to, to record how much fertilizer we're using and match that up with, with the growth response, it's going to be valuable information um, for the likes of reseeding and also uh, helping us to target fertilizer uh, to fields where we're going to get the best return from it. Again, as Avian mentioned, the store accuracy, the, the forward speed, the width, the, the vein settings, all very important and often overlooked. And another thing which, which potentially you need to focus on this year is, is the sulfur inclusion in the fertilizer. Um, sulfur is a, a key nutrient in, in grass growth um, alongside nitrogen. Um, sulfur price, uh, unlike nitrogen, has remained fairly stable. Um, and, and today's the, the inclusion of sulfur 
is probably putting about 10 to 15 pounds a ton um, on, on a 27% can product. Um, and and it's, it, it would be unwise to, to spend so much money on nitrogen um, that, to have grass growth limited uh, by sulfur. Next slide, please, Gillian. So just as, as we move to look to, to some on-farm scenarios um, over the next two to three months, um, the, the, these scenarios are going to be based on, on optimum soil fertility, um, a pH of 6.2 uh, and P and K indexes of 2 plus, um, targeting slurry applications between 22 and a half to 28 meters cubed per hectare or 2 to 2,500 gallons per acre um, with low emission slurry spreading techniques. Um, and, and we're also going to be uh, obviously looking at the, the DERA online crop nutrient calculator. Um, and again, these scenarios are going to be based on optimal uh, fertilizer uh, and grass, grass growth responses, um, as, as mentioned previously by Avine. So we'll move on to the next, the first scenario, please, Gillian. So the first scenario is our, our first cut silage. Um, and, and first cut silage is going to represent the best bang for our buck in terms of kilo of nitrogen applied um, across the, the entire grass growing season. Um, so again, with, with our soil fertility in mind that we just mentioned, um, our, our crop requirements are going to be 120 kilos of nitrogen, 40 kilos of phosphate, and 60 kilos of potash. Now in this scenario, we're, we're going to apply 28 meters cubed of cattle slurry per hectare, or 2,500 gallons per acre, with low emission slurry spreading. And we can see that our, our phosphate um, requirement is, is all, almost filled here, um, and we actually have an, ex, an, ex, an excess of potash uh, in this scenario. So, our deficit here is 91 kilos of nitrogen, uh, which if we were applying a 27% can product is going to equate to 330 kilos of uh, kilo per hectare uh, or, or 2.7 bags per acre. Um, can I get away with sowing less? Some may ask, um, potentially, but you're going to run into to other, uh, other, other issues potentially. As Debbie showed earlier, there, there's an economic uh, response for sowing this fertilizer. Um, and we're going to get the best response uh, out of our first cut silage. And potentially, uh, we, we don't know what, what prices are going to do throughout the rest of the season. But if we're coming out of May with, with a, a full pit of first cut silage um, at, at good quality, that's going to be a, a great resource for us uh, and, and money in the bank. Um, also worth considering is splitting the fertilizer applications to this first cut silage. Um, this will potentially increase the, the, the utilization and efficiency of this fertilizer, um, and it will decrease uh, the risk of, of poor weather or soil conditions coming in. We only have to look at last year, and we saw uh, ground frost uh, on, on the 1st of May. Um, so if, if we can decrease uh, our, our, our dependence on condition, weather conditions being stable, that's going to benefit. However, there are some issues to consider um, with split applications. Is it going to be uh, realistic or feasible to get on with that second application? And based on, on your first application date um, and your proposed cutting date, are, are you going to have enough time there? And also, what, what is the grass cover uh, like when you're going on with that first application? Uh, next slide, please, Dylan. So our second scenario uh, is, is our first grazing scenario with a projected turnout of February or early March. Um, similar to, to, the, to the following grazing scenario, the, the most important point uh, in, this, in these scenarios is to get out early and measure the grazing platform and get and get walking over it, preferably a week to seven days before any livestock go out or any slurry is applied. Um, th there'll be three benefits to that. You'll be able to see what individual fields are like. Um, if you're measuring the grass, you'll be able to establish an average farm cover and you'll be able to, to budget uh, and, and see what, available, what feed is available for you there on, on the grazing platform. And thirdly, it'll give you a chance to physically walk over and, and, and monitor soil conditions and see where it will practically be possible to get slurry to. So in this scenario, um, we're, we're thinking, look, we can, we can try and displace some early spring nitrogen here with the use of slurry. Obviously, our, our silage ground is, is priority for the slurry. Um, but if our, our P and K indexes are sufficient, then there's no point in oversupplying slurry uh, and, and, and wasting the P and K and the slurry in, in order to get extra, extra nitrogen in there, potentially that P and K could be better utilized on the grazing platform. So in this scenario, if, if we typically have an, average, an opening average farm cover between 21 and 2,500 kilos of dry matter, 
there's going to be a third of those paddocks there that, that are going to be less than 2,100 kilos. These third of the paddocks would probably be the ones grazed towards the, the end of the first grazing rotation. And it presents us with the opportunity to get out here um, early to mid-February using low emission slurry spreading techniques um, to, to get slurry, say, 22 and a half meters cube per hectare, 2,000 gallons of slurry onto these, these grazing paddocks, um, which is going to supply us with 23 kilos of nitrogen. Um, the remainder of the grazing platform then, obviously we want to graze that first before we'd apply any slurry to that to prevent contamination of the sward. Um, but potentially if, if, the, if the first grazing rotation is still long enough, there's going to be the option to get onto those paddocks with slurry, um, lower rates, 2,000 gallons per acre, um, after slurry, um, after grazing, sorry, with the slurry uh, and supply those nutrients. In terms of fertilizer, Debbie touched on it earlier and, and the effect of sowing nitrogen early in the season, sort of mid-February to mid-March is, is a risky time. And, and typically for the one kilo of nitrogen, we would expect that growth response of eight to 10 kilos. However, with, with uh, weather and soil conditions, this could be as low as three to five kilos, or it could be as high as 12 to 15 kilos. It's just a very risky time. Um, recent costings have shown that the response, the response that you require for this kilo of nitrogen is, is up around nine to 10 kilos. Um, so again, highlighting how, how risky a period this is to be sowing that nitrogen. In this scenario, however, if we are getting out early and grazing, and you're predicting a, a feed deficit towards the end of March, the start of April, potentially if ground and, and weather conditions are appropriate, there is an economic advantage of going out here and sowing this fertilizer to fill that, that feed deficit towards the end of the first rotation, compared with the cost of, of supplementing the diet with uh, additional concentrate or silages. Um, so in this, in this scenario, I would be suggesting get out with 30 kilos of uh, nitrogen, preferably in a protected urea form, um, and applying that to, to those paddocks with a greater cover than 1900 kilos. Um, and, and following this, uh, you know, little and often um, rotationally. On to the third scenario then, please, Gillian. Mm -hmm. So again, the, the, the final scenario we're gonna talk about here this evening is a, a slightly delayed turnout of early to mid-April. Um, and again, the most important factor in this scenario is getting out early and, and walking the platform and seeing what covers are like and, and where slurry can go. So in this scenario, there's potentially more opportunity to get some to get more slurry onto the grazing platform, depending on your soil analysis and, and your nutrient management plans. Um, but potentially, it's up to 2,500 kilos of dry matter in this situation. If slurry has gone out mid-February, there's, there's going to be a good interval there between slurry application and grazing. Um, and if it's gone out at lower rates um, with the 22 and a half uh, meters cubed per hectare with low emission slurry spreading techniques, the, the contamination issue should be decreased. In this scenario, there's little or no requirement for that early spring nitrogen to be spread. Um, it's unlikely you're going to need that grass at that time of year when the response is going to come. And it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to utilize it. Whenever you do be able, whenever you are able to get out grazing, it's, it's those higher covers that you want to be focusing on first. Um, but if turnout is delayed to this time of the year, it's likely that the rotation length is going to be fairly short from the start. And it's probably not going to allow the, the, the uh, slurry to be applied to those graze swords following grazing, as the interval between slurry application and grazing would be too short. Again, Apply the nitrogen rotationally, little and often thereafter. Last slide, please, Gillian. So the three summary points we have then, only apply nitrogen fertilizer um, early in the season um, if you know that you're able to utilize it and if you know um, you're, you're gonna be able to maximize that grass growth response and the conditions allow. Secondly, apply recommended levels of nutrients to maximize your first cut silage yield. Um, it's going to be the best bang for your buck uh, per kilo of nitrogen. Um, and it's going to be money in the bank uh, going into the rest of the season. And thirdly, focus on controlling the factors uh, within the farm gate that you can control. Um, maximize all, all the factors you've heard about this evening so far in your soil fertility um, and in your application practices um, and try and maximize the amount of grass that you're able to utilize. Thank you.
Okay, thanks very much, Robert. Some uh, really useful practical uh, approaches there in terms of maximizing the use of fertilizer this year. Um, again, just remind everyone to keep entering your questions. We've got a, a really good range of questions and we'll be picking those up shortly. Uh, and do put them into the Q&A box rather than the chat box because it's easier to pick them up there. So we move on to our last presentation of the evening and it's back to AFBE with uh, David Patterson, who's the grassland agronomist at AFBE. And David is going to look at some of the longer term options uh, that we might need to now think about in terms of reducing reliance on fertilizer. So David, over to you, please. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Sinclair, and good evening, everyone. Um, I think you, you, you've all heard a lot of really good uh, information tonight um, about the how to deal with the, the impact of rising fertilizer costs and how to react to that at the present um, and in the incoming season. What I want to do is take a look a little bit further into the future and consider what alternatives there are to uh, using chemical nitrogen fertilizer on grassland. I think by, again, by way of introduction, it's also worth noting that there's also, never mind the, the, the financial or the economic cost of fertilizer, there's also the environmental cost um, of chemical nitrogen as well. And as we uh, think and move towards uh, lower carbon farming, um, one of the uh, mitigations that is available to us as dairy farmers is to take a serious look at how and where we can reduce uh, reliance on chemical nitrogen fertilizer in the first place. And that is that is one of the ways to help reduce the carbon footprint on, 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 a, on any dairy farm for that matter. But back to the talk for tonight, um, in terms of reducing reliance on fertilizer nitrogen, um, I think we need to take a look back at our, our, our swords and the, 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 the species diversity that's in those swords because in the future, to achieve more sustainable grassland, I think we need a, a greater diversity of species uh, in those swords. And I use the word sustainable deliberately because it has to, uh, as I say, make the, the, the physical return and, and productivity, the economic savings and the environmental savings as well. And really what I'm talking about is uh, in, in the context of tonight's talk and uh, with reductions in chemical fertilizer, it's looking at the use of greater use of legumes uh, to be able to fix biological nitrogen in our grassland systems. And in particular, looking at white and red clover. There are other uh, legumes available, but those are the two main ones uh, for this brief talk tonight. Thanks, Gillian. And when we think about diversity um, and how to increase diversity in our pasture, what I'm really talking about is, is, is first of all, the photograph on the left-hand side, where we have a, a very healthy, um, vigorous sward of ryegrass and timothy in, in the grass component and white clover uh, in, in, in the legume component. And you can even see there that you've got a, a greater diversity of species above ground. There's greater diversity below ground as well, I should add. And there's even some pollinators, the bees sitting there on the, on the, uh, uh, on the clover flowers. The right-hand side photograph is taking uh, species diversity a step further uh, and introducing into that same type of sward, maybe uh, as well as grass and clover, um, adding in herbs or, or forb species, such as plantain and chicory. And that's uh, taking the diversity a little bit further and bringing other advantages uh, to, to more sustainable grassland as well. Uh, next slide, please, Julian. But returning just to the first step in that diversity step-by-step uh, -step process, it's introducing white clover in alongside our grass swards. And some of the features of that, uh, first of all, just a few points here. White clover can uh, substitute chemical nitrogen with fixed atmospheric nitrogen. And I should emphasize that's for free. That is uh, being biologically uh, stored through the nodules on the roots of the clover plants in particular. Um, first of all, that nitrogen is available then for the clover to take up and by a clever process of nitrogen transfer, which is happening again um, uh, throughout the growing season, that nitrogen is then available for the grass component in the sward to take up. And when I looked across a range of grassland studies, both in AFBE over the years and elsewhere around uh, the rest of Ireland and the UK, uh, the average 
uh, atmospheric fixation level uh, in a grass white clover sward is in and around 150 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. So that's the ballpark figure in terms of how much chemical nitrogen can be substituted if you have a healthy clover sward. Second of all, there the, the, these swards are ideal for, for, for grazing in particular, uh, grass white clover this is, because of the stoloniferous uh, growth habit of clover. You can see in the photograph that the plant sort of creeps along the, 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 the soil surface horizontally with the stolons and every, at every node then pops up uh, a stem and some leaf and that's what will be grazed off obviously. But that growth habit complements the more vertical type of growth habit of the perennial ryegrass, which is more upright and tufted. So the two complement each other very well and also complement each other below ground also. Aside from that, there's uh, plenty of reports in the literature showing higher dry matter intakes due to the higher digestibility of the white clover uh, tissue itself. And that's largely due to the lower levels of cellulose and lignin. Uh, compared with grass tissue, uh, especially over the uh, middle and latter part of the growing season. Next slide, please, Gillian. And just to touch very briefly on red clover, we mentioned it earlier. Typically, the red clover's use is going to be in silage swards, um, if we're talking about more diverse, more sustainable swards for the future. Um, short relatively short term swards would have maybe Italian and uh, hybrid ryegrasses as a companion. Longer term swards lasting maybe up to eight to 10 years uh, would typically have uh, diploid and tetraploid perennial ryegrass along with some white clover. But the yields and the crude protein that I've put up there, they're, they're very, fairly typical um, from local trials done at Cross Nacrevi over the years. 14 to 16 tonnes of dry matter per hectare per year. Uh, with an average crude protein of 18 to 22%. Downside of red clover, uh, it only persists in, persists in the sward for two to four years. Um, it's a relatively short lived species. Um, it has an upright growth habit, uh, which uh, works well for a, a silage cutting scenario. And it keeps literally, it keeps up with the grass plant. Um, but it has this elevated growing point, which is sitting just above ground level. And that's why sometimes with uh, damage done by, uh, by, by grazing traffic, as well as uh, machine traffic, you can even get lines in the sward where that growing point has been damaged and the plant simply doesn't recover from that. So it's one of the reasons why uh, we have to have a, a different type of management for these swards looking to the future. Next slide, please, Julian. But can these grass clover swards actually deliver on dairy farms? Uh, there's some particularly good work that has been done in recent years down in Chagas Moor Park, and they simply compared side by side uh, two dairy herds, one on a grass only uh, situation for grazing and for silage. And you can see that in the, in the, in the middle column compared on the, right hand, on the right hand column with a grass white clover uh, dairy cow system. And I should say both of these uh, systems were compared side by side, same stocking rate, same amount of meal going into the system, and the, the grass clover swards at typically about 20% uh, clover content. But back to the table, you can see there in the top row, the fertilizer nitrogen was reduced from 250 to about 150 um, kilograms, per kilograms of nitrogen per hectare uh, for, the, for the growing season. But the, the herbage yield, can these swards deliver? The herbage yield was very similar uh, overall um, when you compared the grass only versus the grass white clover. And look, solids per cow were actually higher in the grass white clover, which might be a reflection of the um, higher levels of intake per cow and that higher level of digestibility in the clover tissue. And the overall nitrogen use efficiency, um, no surprises here, was considerably higher, 37 versus 55 for the grass white clover system. So I think these swards and these uh, alternative systems, yes, this is at a research farm and uh, it has to be thoroughly tried and tested out in commercial farms, obviously, but um, the, the, the figures and, 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 and the research trial certainly do stack up in terms of uh, grass white clover swards can deliver in a dairy farm situation. Next slide, please, Julian. But 
there's always some downsides and the, the, the challenges. And I've just listed out some um, of, of the key points that I've picked out of the literature over a whole range of trials done over the years around UK and Ireland. And you can see there um, less predictable spring yields of clover. Although, as we heard earlier, obviously grass can be quite variable in terms of its yielding capacity at certain seasons of the year. Um, second point, yes, you can't deny it. There, there's less out of season growth um, with, with, with any of the clovers, any of the legumes for that matter, uh, than, than generally speaking, the grass species. Um, they have a higher threshold for uh, significant growth come the springtime. There's a perception of poor clover persistency, and that's especially borne out, as I said earlier, with the, the, the red clover, it's just a shorter lived plant, and we can't do a great deal about that. Um, there's also incidents of bloat reported whenever there's high proportions of clover in this ward, but there are also ways of managing that, and it's not, uh, it's not compulsory. It, it, it tends to be uh, on, on, on some, but not all farms. And even if you were making a start, in terms of the, the incoming season um, or, or the, the, the next couple of years, if fertilizer prices keep going the way they are, um, how to establish clover into both uh, new reseed ground uh, where the sword's worn out and also into otherwise very productive, good uh, established ryegrass swords. What are the techniques that we need to, to learn and maybe relearn um, in terms of how to get that clover into the existing swords, because the, the results from Moor Park and all of those other wonderful trials um, can only be achieved if you have a sustainable, continuous, productive level of clover in the sward in the first place. Next slide, please. So just to sum up, um, I think these, these grass clover swards, uh, yes, they're more sustainable, and yes, they can substitute uh, more fertilizer and nitrogen and improve the herbage digestibility. That's, that's clear and that's shown in the evidence. Um, but like I say, there are some establishment and, and persistency challenges uh, with, with, with these swards. And we, we, we have to just develop um, smarter management strategies and the, 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 these uh, different approaches to managing these swords uh, uh, will achieve uh, more sustainable swords into the future in order to achieve um, better cost savings in terms of chemical fertilizer and also those all important environmental savings at the same time. There, Sinclair, I will conclude. Okay, thanks very much, David. And thanks to the other three speakers for, for keeping pretty well on time. And uh, it'll give us now a good chance to address some of the questions. I'm pleased to see a lot of questions coming up in the discussion. I suspect if this was a live meeting, we could be here for another couple of hours yet, but we'll have to manage uh, to address as many questions as we can in, in the time available. Uh, so at this stage, we're, we're going to uh, open uh, the, uh, the question and answer session. We've got all the uh, speakers. And we should also be joined by Jason McFerrin uh, from CAFRI. Jason, as many of you know, is the senior business technologist at CAFRI and will address any of the uh, burning issues in relation to, to farm business planning. So you're very welcome, Jason. <clears throat> so I see we've got, we've got 40 questions and I'm just looking at them here. Um, and there's, there's a really good one here to, to maybe kick off, and it's probably for you, Debbie. And I think it's a very practical question, which a lot of people will be looking at this year, which is basically, I am planning to reduce my end fertilizer application by 100 kilograms per hectare this year. So that's 80 units less uh, fertilizer being applied from 250 back to 150. What impact will this have on my total grass production for the year? A really relevant question and, and a question that a lot of people are asking. So, Debbie, do you want to maybe have a look at that one, please? Um, yeah, OK. So if we are going to reduce fertilizer usage from 250 down to about 150 kilograms of nitrogen, um, you're probably talking there about a reduction in yield of about two tons. So out of 250 kilos, you're going to get a, a grass growth, total grass growth over the season of 11 ton. If you take that back to 150, you're talking about bringing that down to nine ton of um, grass dry matter produced per hectare. 
if you then work that up into what that means for a 40 hectare grazing platform, that means you're going to be about in total 80 tonne of grass short um, compared to if you've been applying a, a higher rate at 250 kilos, which means that that's going to impact on your stocking rate for that grazing platform. You could take that down from about three and a half cows um, to the hectare down to about 2.8, 2.9 on, on my quick calculations there. Um, uh, so you are going to effectively have to find forage for an extra 25, 26 cows that you wouldn't that you've effectively lost there are ways to do that you could bring in an additional area into the grazing platform if you have that available to you or the other option is then to try and buy that into the system um, as concentrate and buy in that extra energy but you're talking i think on my figures is somewhere in around of about 900,000 megajoules of energy that you've got to buy in to replace that extra forage that could cost you anywhere between 16 to 20k um, to do that depending on the spec of your concentrate and in contrast applying that extra 100 kilos of nitrogen fertilizer is probably going to cost you in the region about 9k on that 40 hectare platform so um, you can reduce it but you're going to have to pay for it somewhere down the line in terms of you've lost a stock and rate capability on your platform so you're going to need extra area or you're going to need to buy in that energy in terms of concentrates and that could be quite costly. So the, the forage budgeting is, is a really crucial bit. And I think, I mean, a very practical measure, what you've suggested there is 100 kilos less fertilizer or 80 units less fertilizer is two tons less dry matter per hectare. Yep. So you really need to factor that into the equation in terms of what are you going to replace that with uh, if you're going to keep the same number of stock on the farm. So, you know, I, I think that's, that's the real dilemma that's that's facing everyone this year because there are no simple solutions to that, but at least the, the data there. And probably also, I think one of the key things is going to be measuring grass to know what your, your farm is producing will allow you to, to get a better answer to that as well. So, uh, okay, thanks, Debbie. Well, well, just moving down through the questions, and I see one there for uh, Avine on the whole. Uh, I mean, slurry obviously is so valuable this year, we've got to try and maximize it. And the question is, is there any merit in testing slurry to confirm the nutrient content? I mean, what sort of variation is there in nitrogen content of, of slurry, uh, Evine? Uh, yes, Sinclair, uh, that's a good question. I use the standard figures there, um, and that's what we, we use for uh, the NAP regulations. So on inspection, that's what uh, would be used. Uh, however, there's a lot of interest. Um, you know, is there differences in the times of year, you know, the cattle diet? You know, is there a difference um, in the early autumn compared to later in the winter? Um, or young stock versus older stock, you know, dairy cows versus followers and what they are fed. So it is a useful exercise. The only caveat we put in it is, is just, you know, can you guarantee consistency and accuracy of sampling? Uh, this is the whole safety aspect of taking slurry samples and we would encourage safety first and only to sample, um, you know, from outside mixing points and only where it's safe to do so. Um, and then getting a representative sample from the tank can be difficult. I suppose the best time is uh, just when the tanks have been um, agitated, when they've been mixed, and after a period of time to allow gases to settle, take a sample then or take a sample uh, from the tanker is probably the best. But it's very, very difficult to get a representative sample across the whole tank so um you know but yes it's interesting to compare uh, so it is uh, to okay. see that variation but the practical difficulties uh, are the real challenge so probably in the first instance use the standard values unless you're unless there's something uh, particularly different about the slurry that that makes it that, that would make it uh, have a different analysis so yeah okay absolutely just scrolling down, there's a question here, um, I suppose an optimistic question in some ways. You've mentioned, uh, uh, this is for Robert, I think, you've mentioned maximizing first cut yield, uh, Robert. Would it not be more cost effective to sow less now and grow larger subsequent cuts, second and third cuts, when fertilizer price declines? Somebody's got a crystal ball there to, um, I mean, what's the likelihood of fertilizer price declining? Unfortunately, it doesn't look that promising at the moment. So Robert, any any comment? 
No, well, as you say, nobody has crystal balls, and that would be ill advised for me to sit here and say otherwise. Um, I suppose as we, as we said numerous times, and, and Desi or sorry, Debbie backed up with her point there of of reducing the nitrogen applications. Um, we are going to get best response from our first cut silage, um, and we are going to get better response um from our grass um in terms of a, a cheap feed, and um, compared to making that shortfall up in other ways. Um, the, that sort of talk has been heard out about the country that farmers think that fertilizer price might decrease and if we take a small first cut we can we can maximize later cuts but a very risky strategy um, and for me I, I'd want to be going into uh, the later summer period on, on the best foot forward knowing that you had a good supply of, of first cut silage in the bank. Okay but I suppose pragmatically uh, it probably makes sense to, to only buy enough fertilizer to do the first cut at this stage and, and, uh, and make the maximum use of that and hope that uh, fertilizer prices will, will, will hopefully uh, go down slightly later on, but at least you're not committing uh, to that. But you've still got to make maximum use of, of fertilizer for the first cut. There's an, a, an interesting question there from uh, Stephen McElroy, uh, who's in a three cut system. Uh, and it's saying, should I move from a three cut to a two cut system, obviously to, to reduce the fertilizer use. Previously, first cut was taken on the mid-May uh, fertilizer dates. If he's moving to the 10th of June cut, um, what's uh, obviously uh, there's going to be an impact there on quality, which needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, Robert, do you want to, or Debbie, uh, maybe Robert first? Yeah, yeah, no, feel feel free to chip in Debbie but yes I would imagine the, the quality um, of your forage is going to decrease obviously going from the the, two, the three cut system back to the two cut system um, and it's it's the cost that making up that deficit in quality is going to is going to be through increased meal feeding um, obviously you need to take that into consideration yes your harvest costs will be slightly lower um, and your fertilizer use might be slightly lower, um, but it's a, it's that's a, a short term outlook um, on on a on a longer term problem going into next winter. Any other thoughts, okay. Deborah? No, I, I think you're spot on there, Robert. I mean, in doing that, if you if you do push that first cut date back, the loss in quality could be quite significant there. And it's not only quality in terms of energy, but it's quality in terms of protein as well. And obviously that is incredibly costly to buy in. There's been some work done at Appy a number of years ago looking at, at, at silage production on commercial farms. And when nitrogen fertilizer actually was reduced um, uh, down below what was um, re recommended by RB209, you could see anywhere from a half a point to a full point um, a percentage point reduction in crude protein content of that silage that was then made so that you know that will be significantly costly then to, to purchase later on yeah it's saving cost now but perhaps having to spend more later to to make up uh, the, the difference in terms of silage quality um, yeah and I mean one of the big unknowns in all of this is that fertilizer cost is also affecting the grain growers so, you know, there, there is a potential, hopefully not, but certainly, uh, you know, impact on crop yield if, if grain growers use less fertilizer as well could have other consequences, but um, that's maybe looking too far ahead at the moment. Uh, and uh, one question here, maybe for you, Debbie, it's a good question. The feed value ratio uh, or the economic benefit in March is surprising. Does that mean the early spring grazers, such as in the South, are wasting fertilizer and getting it out early? In February and March, you were showing a low response there in some in some situations. Yeah. So what we looked at from the sort of the average of the grass check data from the last uh, sort of ten years, we got an average um, nitrogen or grass growth response rate of four. Um, now and in sixteen in April, as as Robert mentioned, probably to be about cost effective, you want to be looking at sort of getting at least nine ten kilos of grass per kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer applied. So we're sort of once we get into April, we're not too bad, but once we, we're in March, that can be um, uh, sort of significantly lower. But I think it all depends on, rather than the month of the year, on the conditions immediately following application. And those two weeks, really, after we've applied that fertilizer, because as we've seen, we've got grass growth responses. Sometimes we've got grass growth in excess of 30 kilograms of dry matter per hectare in March. And then, as I've shown on the slides, in July, we've got 
grass growth of 17 kilos of grass because of drought conditions. So I would say rather than focusing on necessarily the month of the year, it's really what are the weather conditions in the next two weeks um, to be like. And I think particularly in March, I mean, the biggest thing that we see in March inhibiting grass growth response is soil temperatures. And once we can get soil temperature, temperatures up above five degrees, um, obviously, then we're going to be more likely to get a, a better grass growth response because we we see that initiation of grass growth at that stage so if we are sort of down in the south um early spring grazers if they are in conditions where they can get good grass growth response at that time of the year because soils are drier it's a wee bit warmer the growing season comes a little bit early then it can be cost effective to apply in march but for a very wet heavy land where the growing season starts a little bit later it does call it into question at that time Okay, two questions here on grass check, uh, one for Debbie first and one for uh, Robert. Aaron McKenna, could predicted end response rate from model values be added to the weekly grass check bulletins? Uh, potentially, yes. But what I would say is there's huge variation. So we can do it based on the modeled plots and we have the data there, but there is huge variation between individual fields and individual farms, depending on soil type, depending on the type of grass that you have. So we can potentially put out figures it's just they've got to be taken with a pinch of salt if you're going to apply them to your farm and make sure because we are working on data from plots where we have uh the correct soil ph in place um the correct soil p the correct p and k's um in there as well um so it's just we just need to bear that in mind but it could be useful as a guide in terms of if you have good ph data so all the uh, good sword type and so on it, it, at least it will give an indication of what their response is like so yep, might definitely. be useful and one then for robert um the um i've forgotten i think it's from andrew crawford could caffrey introduce t-sums uh, that's going back a good few years ago t-sums farmers mm -hmm. weekly that was uh, what back in in the day 20 30 years ago but T sums were used to uh, indicate when optimum time for fertilizer application in spring. Is is that still worth considering, or is it, are you better just to use a, a soil thermometer, Robert? Yeah, but potentially it's a useful thing to, to have out there in in the published press. I, I suppose I'll reiterate the point that Debbie just made. You know, there's going to be huge variation. Um, I, I read an article there last week, and, and one farmer went out um, to a field um, and and it was a south facing field and the soil temperature um, was up eight nine degrees and it went around to the other side of the field where it was north facing and it was four and a half degrees and um, so you know there's huge variation over very short distances never mean never mind across the country um yes soil moisture temper or soil temperature probes um great little bits of kit um relatively inexpensive um and can provide you maybe that reassurance you need uh, on on the spring day Okay, um, yeah, I've got one here. Sorry, I've just missed it. Um, it's from Robert Fife, and again, a good question. Uh, again, uh, coming back to you on this one, Debbie, we'll move on to clover and manures in a minute. <laughs> we'll take the pressure off, but um, the cost price benefits that you showed for graze grass, do they alter much when you're looking at silage systems? And is there a place for multi-cup silage systems the same question as before at present fertilizer cost. So probably the first part is, do the cost price benefits change much with the silage system? So we didn't really uh, look specifically at grazing and silage. We looked at sort of the nitrogen response at a given level of fertilizer application. So that should fairly well apply to both grazing and silage systems. I suppose when we talk about multi-cut silage systems and sort of getting upwards of four cuts in those sorts of scenarios, obviously fertilizer is a bigger proportion of the, of the total overall cost. I think in a four cut systems, it's roughly in around 21% of the overall cost. So the more cuts we go to, obviously the more susceptible we are to increases in fertilizer price rises but as we've already talked about you know the more cuts we have the more opportunity we have for putting high quality forage in the in the clamp um, and and higher energy um, uh, quality in the clamp so it's it's that trade-off between um, really good quality forage um, uh, for the winter period um, versus a little bit extra energy or uh, extra expenditure sorry on fertilizer at the moment okay Again, a, a good practical question here from Cormac McCurvey. Um, I think it was Avine or perhaps Robert who mentioned uh, compaction and the fact that that can limit uh, the grass response to, to fertilizer. 
Um, would there be benefits in looking at it this year to improve in uptake? Um, would the benefits outweigh the cost given the increased price of fertilizer? Uh, Avian or, or Robert, do you want to? Well, Sinclair, anything that improves soil structure should be encouraged. Um, although, you know, you do want to do uh, make a good assessment of the soil structure problem before going in to take any remedial action. So digging a good soil pit and looking down the soil profile, profile to see where the problems are and then taking appropriate action. But I would be in favour of anything that can improve soil structure and relieve any compaction that's there to promote, you know, good grass growth again within, within the field area. Do you want to add anything, Robert? No, just that, as you've been said, reiterate the point, it needs to be tailored. Um, and sometimes in, in some of the soil alleviation, soil compaction alleviation measures, um, they can result in very heavy machinery traveling over ground when conditions are not ideal and in some cases, you know, creating more issues than they're solving. So it, it needs to be um, looked at on a field by field basis. Yeah, certainly I think the evidence in terms of the impact of aeration is quite variable. You need to get the conditions just right in terms of soil conditions and so on to uh, to get the benefits. And as you say, Robert, sometimes you you can do more damage if the conditions aren't right. Um, question for you, Robert, again here uh, on sulfur. You mentioned sulfur. Uh, is that recommended for first cut, second cut, or third cut, or all cuts? Yeah, no, I, I think first cut and second cut, uh, definitely. Um, and, and yes, th there's going to be a need for it in, in third cut, but I suppose um, maybe weighted towards first and second cut. Um, a, a rough rule of thumb is uh, for four parts nitrogen, there should be one part sulfur. Um, um, and th there has been numerous studies suggesting that uh, that that, inc that inclusion of sulfur um, over first and second cut silage uh, represents a, a 10 to 15% increase in yield. Okay, yeah, very useful. I'm just going through here. Um, trying to pick up the most relevant questions. There's, there's quite a lot. Um, question here from Richard Moore. Do protected urea fertilizers have a detrimental effect on soil pH? Obviously, given the importance of, of soil pH, it's uh, critical to, to ensure we're, we're keeping that well above six. Um, Yvonne or Robert, do you want to comment or, or David? I certainly haven't come across any evidence of that. The, the, the studies we have done have looked, in fairness, more at the grass productivity, the, 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 the chemical, com chemical composition of the grass and the yield, obviously, but um, haven't come across any impact, any negative impacts on pH at this stage. Okay, and I'd, I'd be surprised. I mean, uh, the protection is unlikely to have an impact on uh, yeah. uh, on the response. Okay, I'll pick up a clover one here, uh, David. Um, okay. There's one asking for uh, how clover works, but I think uh, you, know, you can explain that another day. That could probably take in terms of the fixing. Um, would it pay to sow clover in the spring, uh, or when is it best to stitch in clover to get the benefit this year? a challenge to really get any benefit from clover in the current that's more of a long term but um, thoughts on that um, david yeah generally speaking i think on on the, the the balance of previous trials my own experience and and, and farmer feedback uh, spring better than autumn simply because you've got the 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 longer warmer days ahead of you when you sow in the spring there's always a snag and the downside is there's likely to be a greater population of uh, broadleaf, what you might call soft weeds, which will appear in any spring reseed. Um, so you just have to be prepared to cope with that. Doesn't necessarily mean spraying. Um, it could be strategic grazing or big baling, perhaps, um, if there's a, a profusion of, of, of soft weeds comes up with the grass and the clover. So short answer, spring would be preferable, April rather than August. And another, another clover question here, David. Um, one of the big challenges, obviously, is clover's poor growth in spring. How can a dairy system compensate for clover's lack of growth in spring? Yeah, that, that gap period um, where the clover isn't 
growing and, and fixing nitrogen and all of those wonderful things, um, and yet the grass uh, could be growing earlier. That is a problem if you're totally reliant on a grass clover sward, obviously. Um, but when I was down recently talking to the folks down at Johnstown Castle, and they are actually uh, uh, converting part of their, their dairy unit to uh, grass clover, they were planning, they've had a couple of years of experience, I should say, they are uh, building up greater amounts of grass clover silage stock to uh, buffer through that, that spring gap period and also tactical use of an early input of a moderate amount of artificial nitrogen in the, in the, in the spring period, say 30 to 40 units in the spring to boost the grass growth. And it, it almost connects back to one of Robert's comments, um, that early season nitrogen input, um, you have to be prepared then to obviously utilize that well, which means getting it grazed off Otherwise, the grass that you've boosted in the early season to counteract the spring gap will only compete too strongly with the clover and the sward. So it's a, 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 a trying to solve one problem, you create another. But um, I think as long as it's well utilized, you can you, you can ride through that spring gap. OK, thanks, David. Um, we'll take two more questions, just a, a very straightforward one here. Um, given the importance of soil pH, um, and Debbie and Davine both showed how fertilizer response or efficiency is reduced at lower pH. Question here is, is it better to go for a pH of seven, probably on the high side, but is it better to aim above six and a half, let's say, as opposed to aiming for pH of six? Is there any evidence you know, as you get above six, six point three, is there any benefit in going above that with more lime? Uh, Debbie, do you want to go um, first, maybe? And uh, yeah. So obviously, for from the studies that have been done over the years, about six point three has been sort of defined as optimum for grassland systems. I suppose uh, if we're going slightly above that, there's not too much impact in terms of nutrient availability and nutrient uptake. But if we do get into very high pH soils, then we get, for example, more calcium in the soil, which if we've got issues with phosphorus, it can lock up some of the phosphorus. So once you get into the extremes at the other end of pH, um, you do end up in scenarios where you're reducing the amount of your main nutrients available. Going up as far as seven shouldn't have too major an, an implication, but there's really no additional benefit to it over and above that of the optimum of about 6.3 at the minute. As far as I'm aware, anyway. I think, I think some, some of that debate comes from the fact that um, in the South, their recommendation would be slightly higher than ours. They would be pushing you know, to that 6.5 and above. Uh, but as Debbie says, there's no evidence for us to change our recommendation yet. But if that evidence, you know, becomes a part, uh, you know, becomes available, we'll, it'll be looked at again. So. Uh, okay. Um, another one in line. I'm just picking up from Neville Graham on the on the chat box. Given the current conditions, if lime has been spread, um, how long before fertilizer application should take place, particularly if it's urea-based fertilizers? I know there is some evidence around impact of liming on uh, inefficiency. Debbie, do you want to pick that one? Um, yes, so there's a couple of things to bear in mind with lime. So lime and urea, if you're applying urea first, then there's no issue with applying lime afterwards. You roughly want to leave about a 10 day window just to be sure. But if you're applying lime first, that can inhibit the use of the urea. So you want to wait actually um, somewhere as much as, as, as up to three months. Um, so in reality, if we are thinking about applying lime, actually, in particular to silage swords, it's actually better done towards the end of the season because when we are thinking about silage swords, some of the part particulate matter from the lime um, can inhibit the ensiling process. So if we're applying lime in the spring and then trying to ensile a sward um, pretty soon after that, that can have knock-on impacts there. So yeah, uh, urea first, then lime at the minute, about a 10-day gap. Um, if you do need to do lime first, then you've got to wait for about three months um, for urea application. Yeah. Okay, very useful. Thanks, Debbie. And we'll maybe take the last question, which is from Aidan Cushenhan. And I'm pleased there's a question for Jason, um, as, as he's been on the panel. Um, any comments on how I should organise my budget to allow for increased fertiliser price? Really important question in terms of, you know, how do we deal with the, the real practical issue of 
a much bigger budget requirement for fertilizer this spring. So Jason, is that one you would like yeah. to address, please? Okay, um, I thought I was going to get away easy there this evening, <laughs> um, just listening. Um, yeah, ov obviously, as, as uh, fertilizer prices have um, maybe tripled in, in some cases, uh, that means if we do everything the same as we did last year, uh, we're, we're going to triple the, the amount of money we need uh, as well. So from a cash flow point of view, um, if we're going to um, be able to buy that or, um, all at once, that might be difficult. Um, from a credit point of view, certainly the merchants aren't able to, to give as much credit as or, or as long a, a credit period as they have in the past. Um, so you're going to need to pay that off. And in a lot of cases, you're, you're going to need uh, the money available to pay when you're ordering it. Um, and certainly um, at delivery, if not shortly after that. So I think some of the points that the other panelists have, have mentioned um, thinking about first cut silage first of all you know getting getting enough there uh, getting enough fertilizer on the farm uh, to get you through your first cut uh, silage um, that'll do two or three things it'll, it'll mean you're you're only uh, dealing with the the payments and the budget for that um, that proportion uh, of your fertilizer we don't know what's going to happen down the line in terms in, in terms of uh, the prices going up or, or down but at least it'll spread that cost uh, Going, uh, going over a longer period. Um, in terms of if, if finance is needed, um, if it is required, if, um, if it's tight um, in terms of cash flow, um, I, I would recommend going to the banks uh, early um, and speaking to them. Certainly if there's an overdraft facility there, you, you can use that. Um, banks probably won't be overly keen to, to extend an overdraft uh, to, to pay for fertilizer. So it would be more uh, a short-term loan um, maybe a, a five, six month loan um, and getting that paid off um, before the, the autumn winter time again then. Yeah, good, good comment, uh, Jason. And probably better to deal with that issue now than, you know, not buy the fertilizer and end up having to, to go with a bigger borrowing requirement next winter, which is, you know, which could be uh, a real disaster. Well, it's, it's spreading the risk, and I suppose so. Um, all being well, prices will drop later in the year, but we, we just don't know that at this stage. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, Jason, and thanks to all the panellists. I'm just conscious of time, and I see that the numbers are dropping off here, understandably, uh, after half past nine in the, in the evening. Um, what we will do is uh, aim to pick up the questions that haven't been answered, and uh, Jason Rankin in, in AgriSearch assures me that we will we'll try to address these and put them up on the uh, on the three websites. That's the AFPE, AgriSearch and uh, CAFRI websites uh, for everyone who, who hasn't had the question answered. I think we've we've given a fair run through most of them and apologies to those uh, that we, we weren't able to address. So maybe if I could just uh, sum up at this stage, just take uh, a second or two to, to sum up and uh, again, thank all the speakers. Um, but really just to look at the, the key messages and thanks Gillian. Uh, I mean, the bad news is really nothing we can do about it. Recent fertilizer price increases will significantly increase the cost of producing both grazed grass and grass silage. And I think Debbie showed that very clearly in her presentation, the, the sort of implications we're looking at. But the issue remains, good quality grass is still our cheapest feedstuff. Uh, and really, uh, in most cases, uh, even with the increases in fertilizer costs that we're looking at, it's still economic to apply chemical M up to at least 200 kilograms of M per hectare or 160 units per acre, providing the grass is well utilized. Uh, and that is a big proviso. But if you looked at, at um, Debbie's response curve, the response to N up to 200 and certainly even beyond that up to 250 is fairly linear there. That's when you're getting the best response. So we're obviously not going uh, to the levels that were applied before, but uh, as Debbie clearly showed in her presentation, the economics, economic reality is it still pays to use fertilizer because the alternatives are all more expensive in the majority of cases. But obviously within that, we want to maximize the grass response from the fertilizer that is applied through good management practices. So even more, it's emphasizing the importance of soil health uh, 
particularly pH, phosphate and potash. Sulfur, when it's needed, uh, is also crucial and, and represents good value for money. Timing of fertilizer application, you know, keeping a good eye on the weather, watching the grass check, uh, grass growth uh, prediction curve to see when we're going to be in a period of really good growth, because that's when we're going to get maximum uh, response to fertilizer. And obviously, uh, there's no point in growing uh, good grass and then not using it. So that means efficient silage making, minimizing losses in the, uh, in the harvesting and at the, at the silo and at the silo phase during feed out, and also utilizing grass uh, in the field through the grazing animal. And that means good monitoring, good measuring of what's going on and making sure that the grass that is grown is, is being utilized effectively. Slurry and manures are valuable sources of nutrients, even more valuable than ever. So we really do need to make maximum use of them. Uh, and that's where nutrient management planning, and there's a lot of good tools on the CAFRI website. So there's lots of good information there about how to make best use of slurries and manures. And let's hope this good weather continues that we've had in January. We're not going to get a, a better start to February. If we can get another week or two of this good weather, then hopefully ground conditions will be ideal uh, once we get through the closed period and uh, we can start to get slurry out. And in the longer term, there's no doubt white and red clover, they've been talked about for a long time, uh, but uh, if fertilizer prices are going to remain above what we've been used to in the past, then we really have to look seriously at white and red clover, uh, given the, the potential they have to reduce reliance uh, on end fertilizer. But, you know, I, I think a key thing that came out from, from Debbie's presentation tonight is, uh, yes, by all means, think about reducing fertilizer application. But remember that for every 100 kilos of N, you use less. And that was the example Debbie used, or 80 units per acre less. Typically, you will reduce grass yield by about 18%. So that has to be made up somewhere in the system. So somewhere else, you either have to have fewer animals, more acres, or buy alternative feed, uh, and none of the alternative feeds represent a uh, better value than grass. So that's the, the unfortunate uh, dilemma that we're in at the moment. And uh, it really is a case of trying to, to do everything we can to maximize the value of, of fertilizer that's applied this spring in particular. And then let's go through and see uh, what the rest of the year brings in terms of fertilizer prices. So uh, again, thanks to all our speakers. Thanks to everyone uh, who has tuned in. Uh, we've had a very good response and I hope the information has been useful. Uh, it's the start of, 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 I'm sure, a lot of information that will come uh, over the next month or two. There's lots of advice out there through AFI, CAFRI uh, and others who will, who will help uh, talk people through this. And Jason has just flagged up some forthcoming webinars that, that might be useful. Um, Fertilizer planning for beef and sheep is on Monday, uh, 31st of January. Uh, arable conference, then 1st of February. Sheep conference, 2nd of February. And Fomintix, 7th of February. Uh, nitrogen is a big issue on the arable conference on the 8th of February. And then sheep conference, UGS uh, conference, uh, all, uh, all online again uh, this year. So unfortunately, we're not going to meet face to face. Uh, for another few months, but hopefully that's something for the future. And then uh, an ag research webinar on the 1st of March, which is multi-species swords, a view from the farm. So lots of good information coming through in webinars uh, over the next month. And uh, it's, uh, it's important to, to tune into those. And I think there's one last slide, perhaps. Um, yeah, and that's to remind me that, uh, again, ag research in particular are very keen that you complete the feedback survey. It takes a few moments at the end of this um, webinar, but again, it helps to, to uh, feedback to us in Ag Research whether this is useful. Uh, and uh, also if you've got ideas for future webinars, uh, future events that, that help uh, to deal with the, the many challenges that farmers face, then we'd be pleased to hear from you. So thanks again, everyone, and uh, I uh, hope the information has been helpful. Thanks to speakers. Thanks to uh, uh, those who tuned in and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>